Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie The Great McGinty from 1940. The studio is Paramount Pictures, release date was August 23rd, 1940. The running time, 82 minutes, and it was in black and white. Leonard Maltin from his classic movie guide gives it 3 out of 4 stars. He writes, Preston Sturgis's directorial debut and Oscar-winning screenplay isn't up to his later comedy classics, but Brian Donlevy is excellent as a bum who is manipulated into the governor's chair by a crooked political machine. Typical Sturge's sharp dialogue and fine work from his stock company of character actors. Donlevy and Akeem Tamaroff reprise their roles four years later in The Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Now, I've covered a number of Preston Sturgis films already on this podcast, as I have a DVD box set of his best-known films. And as Malton mentioned, this was Sturgis's directorial debut. Okay, let's get into the making of the film. So Sturgis made a name for himself writing screenplays, but he wanted a chance to direct his own films. To do this, he bet on himself by selling the screenplay to the great McGinty to Paramount for only $10. And you heard me right, 10 bucks. However, on one condition, he was to direct the film. Paramount agreed, and Sturgis ended up winning an Oscar for Best Screenplay, too. Sort of like what Sylvester Stallone bet on himself after he wrote the script to Rocky, only he wanted to play the lead role. Now, Sturgis got the idea for this film from a Chicago-area judge who shared stories with him about city elections, along with being inspired in part by the career of the early 20th century politician and lawyer William Solzer. The film was released a year before Solzer's death at the age of 78. Okay, let's get into the film. So it begins with the following written introduction. This is the story of two men who met in a banana republic. One of them was honest all of his life, except for one crazy minute. The other was dishonest, all except one crazy minute. They both had to get out of the country. Inside a nightclub, we meet Tommy Thompson, played by Louis Jean Haight and the bartender, Dan McGinty, played by Brian Donlevy. Tommy is having a drink and a sullen chat with the woman who is the main dancer at the nightclub. Tommy had a great life, but his marriage and career fell apart and no longer cares about anything. Dan helps a drunken Tommy to the bathroom to sober up. While in the bathroom, Dan prevents Tommy from killing himself when he notices in the mirror Tommy pulling out a gun. Dan and the dancer take Tommy back to the bar and talk some sense into him. Dan divulges he was once a state governor, until he lost everything as well. Both are exiled from the United States. Dan then shares his stories in flashbacks, when he was homeless back in the States. Move along now and give your friends a chance. And don't forget the mayor, who didn't forget to remember the less fortunate on this cold election night. All right, boys, mosey around to that tool shed, right around the corner. Don't forget now. Come on, boys, step right along. There's a couple of bucks in it for you. That's a boy, right around the tooth shed. Don't you? Could you use a couple of bucks? Who do you think you're kidding? Oh, I ain't kidding. As soon as you finish your soup, mosey around that tool shed. They'll tell you just what to do. Come on, boys. All right, boys, step right up. Take it easy. Right over there. Right around the tool shed, fellas. All right, come on, boys. Give your friends a chance. Come on, you're next. Come on, there's plenty more, boys. Come on, come on, one at a time. Don't forget who give it to you, boys. Soup guy sent me over. Some soup, ain't it? Certainly kind of the man. Never to think... mind the applesauce. How do I get the two bucks? Very simple, baby face. You just go down and vote for Mayor Tilly Gas and come right back here and collect. How do I know you'll be here? How do you know I'll be here? How do you like that? Listen to this guy. You fell in full of soup and right away you don't trust nobody. You got your soup, didn't you? Well, you'll get your two bucks. The nerve some guy's got. How do I know you'll be here? Go around the corner to the barber shop on Van Buren, 2121. Did you register? No. It's all the same. Look, when the guy asks your name, that's the watcher, see? You say, uh, hello, Bill, then he'll call out the right name for you. You vote, and that's all there is to it. 2121 Van Buren. What do you get for repeating? Who said anything about repeating? Where do you think this is? Hicks Corners? Some people is too lazy to vote, that's all. They don't like this kind of weather. Some of them are sick in bed and can't vote. Maybe a couple of them croaked recently. That ain't no reason why Mayor Telling Gas should get cheated out of their support. All we're doing is getting out the vote. The watcher will give you a ticket. 
What if I give you two tickets? Two tickets is four fish. And three is six. And four is eight. You can't get away from arithmetic. Give me one of them lists. Smart guy. Next. Huh? Your name, please? Where? Hello, Bill. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Rufus J. Whittacombe, 165 North Clark Street. How you been, Rufus? Fine, Bill. Sit right down. Rufus J. Whittingham. Where the comb? Just, uh, just pull the handle, Rufus. Well, so long, Bill. So long, Rufus. Give my regards to Minnie. Uh, yes, I'll tell her you were asking for her. Hello, Bill. Oh, hello. Hello, hello. How you been? Oh, fine, fine. Bad stuff. <laughs> I've got another <laughs> list here for... Oh. Yeah. Emmanuel J. Goldberg, 117 Davison Road. Right this way, Miss Goldberg. Dr. Heinrich L. Schutzendorf. Thank you, Heinrich. Dr. Heinrich L. Why, I could have sworn Dr. Schutzendorf was dead. Not yet, lady. Not quite. <laughs> so, if you think voting in today's elections is corrupt... Homeless people were being paid and fed to vote for specific candidates way back when in certain cities. And just like when kids used to put on different masks during Halloween and go back to the houses to get more candy, Dan did the same thing to get a few more dollars in his pocket. Of course, the corrupt politician receiving the votes didn't mind at all. Dan pulls this scam all over town in different polling places in order to earn some quick cash. A whole $74. However, the shyster running the scam for the big boss named Skeeters, played by William Demarest, wasn't expecting someone like Dan to game the system. And he doesn't have the cash to pay Dan off. Skeeters takes Dan to the campaign headquarters of the mayor, where Dan gets to gorge on the buffet. The mayor's campaign manager is horrified to learn that Dan has voted 37 times. In reality, the mayor's campaign is run by the boss. That's his character name, and it's played by Akeem Tamaroff. He's essentially an organized crime boss. So the boss instructs the manager to pay off Dan as agreed upon. Dan meets the boss and isn't impressed or intimidated by him. The boss likes Dan's hard-nosed attitude and hires him to be part of the mob. Yes? That slug is here. Send him in. And I said, what do you mean about me? What do you mean? Wait a minute. Now, listen, you and I are... Listen, you want to go over it again? Got a new suit. It looks more like the suit got you. Listen, you. You listen for a change. The reason you are alive and walking around in that... And that a horse blanket isn't because I like you, see? It's because I can use some guts in my business. Not guts behind a gun. See, anybody's got that. But what the bear meets, like I got. There's been too much rat play in this city, and it's unhealthy. It introduces a very bad element, like Louis, see? Take away his rod, and what you got left? A violet. What I'm in is a business, and business got to be run business-like. When a customer is late and a guy like Louis handles him, he discontinues to be a customer. You think you're tough, eh? Tough enough? I could slap you down with one hand. You and who else? All right, I haven't got time now. You'll find out. 
In the meanwhile, if you want to do some collecting, you got a job. I'll give you a few names that are behind it, and if you can collect, you get 20%. I pay hospital bills, too. Protection, eh? And good protection. If it wasn't for me, everybody would pick on them. They'd be at the mercy. Now you start... Yeah. You start with Madame La Hoya. She runs a kind of a fortune-telling parlor. And you tell that all... Bad legs, it's 250 or Madame La Hoya doesn't Hoya anymore. You get me? I work and slave and give the best years of my life to put away a few miserable bucks with the sweat of my brow. And then you bloodsuckers suck it away from me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself to gouge a poor, honest old woman. You got the entirely wrong slant on this. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. Now, wait a minute, Miss... Uh... Just call me Juliet. Juliet. You've got to pay protection. Do you want to be at the mercy of every slug that wears a uniform? You want the fire commissioner telling you that your joint is a trap? Or the health inspectors telling you that your air is vicious? Or the plumbing inspectors saying that your pipes stink? Now look, Julia, you need somebody to cooperate all those guys and protect you from human greed. You've got to pay somebody. But buying from us is just like getting club rates. Well... I'm just a poor old woman, but you explain everything so nice. How much was it? Two and a half yards? That's right. Thanks. You're a nice looking boy to be doing this kind of work. Do you want to go upstairs and have your fortune told? Oh, thanks, Julia. This is strictly business with me. Well, you know where it is. Now, Dan has the ability to be sweet to certain people, like the last woman, or get rough with unsavory characters that decide they won't pay. Which is what Dan did to a large fellow who told Dan he wouldn't pay and thought he could knock out Dan. It didn't end up well for the guy and Dan got the $500 from him. Dan ends up collecting over $1,000 which impresses the boss who didn't expect to collect a tenth of that amount. We then cut back to the present day at the International Bar. But he was always a little muscle bound, see? I could beat him to the punch. Boy, we had some Brannigans. I thought you said you were the governor of a state. Yes, you was just a cheap crook. Well, you gotta crawl before you creep, don't you? <laughs> I collect the chicken feed for a while, see? Then the guy makes me an alderman and I move in on the second floor. You know, bus franchises, garbage disposal, nice stuff. A hundred thousand dollars! That's what they tell me. But that's a confounded outrage, Mr. Alderman. Even in the days of Boss Herman, we didn't pay that price for franchises. Even in the days of Bathhouse Jake. Those boys were pikers compared to this mob. Ah, <laughs> oh, you don't mean that, Mr. Maxwell. You've got to remember that everything's gone up. Living expenses is higher, there's an income tax now, you're dealing with a better class of men. Bathhouse Jake. I will not pay graft. Millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Well, you could call it advertising. No, sir. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Dangerfield. Alderman McGinty's in conference just now. I certainly will. Thank you. <laughs> Go on, Skeeters. Back of this agitation, said the mayor, are so-called pious men who have accepted money from racketeers and gamblers in sanctimonious secrecy. The petition was filed by Dr. Jonas J. Jarvis, chairman of the Civic Purity League, Incorporated. Ah, they're always talking about graft, but they forget. If it wasn't for graft, you'd get a very low type of people in politics. Men without ambition. Jellyfish. Especially since you can't rob the people anyway. Sure. How was that? What you rob, you spend, and what you spend goes back to the people, so where's the robbery? I read that in one of my father's books. That book should be in every home. What a racket. That was I... Hey, shut up! Quit sucking your clackers, you! And don't drop your truck on the carpet! Now get out of here! Follow you! Get me Jarvis. Schutznei, Stuhl. I suppose you saw the afternoon papers, huh? 
They cut down good trees to print stuff like that on them. Look, Jonas. We need a new face. Clean. Typical American. Upright, dependable. Somebody they don't know too much about. What do you think of McGinty? The older man. Never heard of him. Well, that's just what I'm talking about. Hello, McGinty. McGinty, wait a minute. McGinty, please. Be back in a little while. Yes, Mr. McGinty. Just a minute, McGinty. 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 Aren't you ashamed of yourself? After the papers called out the corrupt mayor, the boss decides that Dan McGinty would be the perfect new face for politics, as he's an unknown that can be sculpted to be exactly what the papers want. And in turn, the boss keeps his power and wealth. The Reform Party is the boss. The first point of business is to arrange a marriage for Dan because it plays better for women voters. Dan refuses at first as he's a steadfast bachelor. However, the secretary for the boss, Catherine, played by Muriel Angelus, proposes a marriage of convenience with her. And she doesn't want to be married either. But it's a way to climb out of her secretarial job. Both have mutual interests that way. It's purely business. Dan thinks it over and of course agrees. He's kind of nervous. <laughs> he don't want the boys to eat everything up before he gets there. <laughs> I ordered a swell feed for you. Oh, a big blowout. Oh, but... You like caviar? Yes, of and course. And four I... sweet sour cream and blinis, shashlik, and more booze than you ever seen in your life. <laughs> this oh. is going to be some smear. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I... It's wonderfully kind of you, but I can't come. I... Why not? I'm expected home. I didn't have time to explain everything to you. What kind of a wedding is this? Oh, can't you come for a little while, maybe? Oh, I can't. It's almost six o'clock. All right, send her home in a taxi. There's plenty of things. She'll go home in any kind of a rig she wants, then you keep your big trap shut. Listen, you... Oh, no, come on, boys. Not on the wedding day. Please. And what a wedding. Get off me, get off. Will you quit wiggling? I'm going to flag it off. Lay off that dog while you're clean and sweet. Wouldn't hurt to give him a bath either. Phew. Dunk yourself in that now. (laughs) Well, I'll see you at the office tomorrow. Thank you so much for bringing me home. Would you like to come up and have a drink and see where I live? Well, I really ought to be getting down there. (laughs) One of us ought to be there. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, let him wait. Sure, I'll come up and have a drink with you. You stick right there, buddy. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh. Mr. McGinty. Yeah? I, uh, I did tell you I was married before, didn't I? Sure, what about it? Oh, nothing. I never can find this key. I, uh, I divorced him on grounds of desertion. I don't know where he is, and I, I don't care either. You ought to put it on a little chain and hook it on the bag. <laughs> Be a good idea, wouldn't it? There's something else I probably should have told you before, but I really don't see that it makes the slightest difference, do you? There it is. Oh. Do you like gin or? Well, that's all I've got anyway. Take your hat. That was his idea. I think you look very well in it. Mm, like a coal stove. I suppose we are really married, aren't we? I mean, legally. That's what the guy said. I, uh, I don't want you to think that I've been concealing anything from you. Uh, there's no reason why I should, is there? It's just that in the excitement, I... You what? Sit down, Mr. McGinty.
Rub it the other way, will you? Oh, I'm sorry. You see... That's what I had to tell you. They're mine. Now you know. And just like that, Dan not only has a new wife, but two kids and a dog. Catherine is actually very caring and kind and a nice balance to the gruff exterior that Dan likes to show. And while the marriage isn't traditional, Catherine seems to truly care about Dan and his well-being. Dan, of course, wins the election to be the new mayor, not because he's a savior, but the power and corruption from the boss, which can essentially elect any candidate that he chooses. The corruption includes setting up railroad lines, bus lines, and other public works, but the contracts are all given to companies owned by the boss. While the business owners not associated with the boss, well, they suffer. The general public just sees progress and infrastructure being built, but behind the scenes, the mob is getting rich, and Dan facilitates a graph by being the mayor. Even though Dan and Catherine have a sham marriage, Dan gets jealous that Catherine sees a man on the side, privately. Kind of funny how things work out that way. It's never just business, right? Dan eventually feels bad about being upset with Catherine and changes his feelings towards her and spends more time with her children, and their relationship becomes closer. Being closer with Catherine also changes Dan's perspective about his job as mayor and the problems of the average citizen in the town he runs. And maybe being a talking head for the mob isn't what he really wants in life. So there's about 20 minutes left, and you already know that Dan becomes governor. But what type of stance does Dan take? Does he continue to do whatever the boss wants? Or does he try to do what's right for the people of the state? And what led to him being exiled in a different country? Well, it's all answered in the final 20 minutes. So The Great McGinty might not be the screwball comedy that Preston Sturges is best known for, but it's a well-done satire of politics that sadly still exists today. Nothing ever changes. Today, they're not called mobsters. They're called lobbyists. And they run the entire political system, unfortunately. And watching this movie just shows how often history repeats itself over and over. All right, some fun facts. Akeem Tamaroff's performance as the boss was the inspiration for the character Boris in the classic Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon two decades later. Remember Natasha and Boris. When our last episode was switched off in utter disgust by over 37 million anxious viewers, those two wrongs, Boris and Natasha, were proving they couldn't make a right. A right bad idea. Think, darling, think. There must be something really rotten we can do today. I'm thinking. But the worst I come up with is helping to make Moose and Squirtle show one hour longer. Oh, just like you, darling. Always trying to help others get a little more pain out of life. Then suddenly a thought struck him like a 20,000 volt charge. Boris, you have great idea. No, but I have defective cord on electric pencil sharpener. I have it, darling. A contest. I like being evil because in 25 words or less. I like it. I like it. Before the title of The Great McGinty was decided upon, the following titles were considered. The Story of a Man. The Vagrant. The Mantle of Dignity. <laughs> the Biography of a Bum. I like that one. And Down Went McGinty which was actually used in the film's release in the UK. Susan Hayward and Patricia Morrison both tested for the role of Catherine. All right, I do have an old-time radio adaptation from August 27, 1945, from the Screen Guild Theater. So why don't I play that for you, and then I'll be back next week with yet another random movie from my DVD collection. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, The Great McGinty, the starring players... This is Ruth Hersey. It's Brian Dunlavey. And this is Akeem Tamiro.
Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in one of the most delightful screen plays of recent years. The paramount picture, The Great McGinty. It stars Ruth Hussey as Catherine, Brian Donlevy as McGinty, and Akeem Tamirov as the boss. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in The Great McGinty. That's the thing that gets my goat. I don't mind this banana country. I don't mind the heat. I don't mind the flies. But that crummy piano keeps saying I'm down. Keeps reminding me I used to be up. Yeah, I said up. And I mean way up. I used to be governor of a state. Sort of funny the way I got started in politics. It's election night and I'm on the soup line. I don't have one thin dime to my name, and this guy steps up and kind of whispers. Hey, buddy, you want to make yourself two bucks? All you got to do is vote for mayor. How can I vote? I'm not even registered. Are you kidding? Come on. Two bucks a vote. (laughs) That's easy, though. But later, when I drop in at this address that he gives me, sort of like a club it was, and try to collect what's coming to me... Thirty-seven times. You mean you voted 37 times? That's right, 37 times. What's that? Who voted 37 times? This lug right here, he claims we owe him 64 bucks. 74. <laughs> well, now, look, all I <laughs> can right, say is... All right, all right. Pay him off. Oh, sure, I was gonna anyway. Yeah, in the pig's poke you would. Now, look, you. Huh. Don't you know you ain't supposed to vote more than once? Says who? Oh, ho, <laughs> Tough guy, eh? You know, the last guy talked to me that way, I... Hey, hey, boss! Boss, we're in! 301 for chilling gas. We win. Sure, Louis, sure. We always win. Well, how about it, tough guy? Hmm? Have a drink? Maybe I will. What are you gonna have? He takes Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola? Huh. How's my back hair, Flossie? Hey, listen, Give you... Give me a like... double fudge pecan twist with an extra cherry on top of it. And if you're out of that, give me a slug of whiskey and a bottle of beer. A funny guy, eh? I guess you don't know who I am. That's right. Who are you? I'm someone you better not forget the next time you see me, so just to help you remember. Why, you... <clears throat> that's to pay you off. <clears throat> and that's for interest, and this one's gonna be... Lay off, lay off, do you hear? Cut it out, Lee. Cut it. Put away the gun. What, gee, boss, I, I... You know, you know, tough guy, you sort of... Um, sort of give me an idea. I could use somebody that's got some real nerve. Not nerve behind a gun. Anybody's got that like Louis, see? You take away his rod and what you got left? A violet. Oh, no, boss, I... I mean somebody that can use his mitts. You know, mm. like me. You think you're tough, eh? Tough enough. I could slap you down with one hand. You and who else? All right, all right. I haven't got time now. Now, starting tomorrow, you're working for me. Says who? And for how much? Now, listen, you! Take your finger out of my face. What? (laughs) Hey, this guy kills me. He thinks he's me. (laughs) Yeah, we got along fine right from the start. So he puts me on the collection route. The tough ones. The mugs that thought they didn't need protection. I have a little talk with some of them. One of them goes to a hospital, and then all of a sudden, collections pick up. That's how I start, you see. And then, after a while, the boss makes me an alderman, and I move in on the second floor. You know, bus franchises, garbage disposal, nice stuff. Then uh, he's going to make me a judge, (laughs) just for the laugh, except they picked that time to turn on the heat. Mm. Look at the headlines, will you? Impeach the mayor, city filled with graft. Civic purity leaked to act. Say, getting so you can't make a dishonest dime in this town. Yeah, we gotta do something, I guess. Mm. McGinney. What? You wanna be reform mayor? What do you mean, reform mayor? What do you think it means? Don't make me say everything twice, will ya? You wanna be reform mayor, mayor of this city? What have you got to do with the reform party? (laughs) I am the reform party. Who do you think? 
Since when? Since a long time. In this town, I'm all the parties. You think I'm going to starve every time they change administrations? Well, then, where does this purity league come in? They come in the back door every Wednesday. <laughs> well, how about it? You want to be mayor? Well, sure, I guess so. All right, you're in. You'll have to kiss a lot of babies, shake a lot of hands, and be... So- hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You'll have to get married right away. What do you mean, get married right away? What do you think it means? Do I have to say everything twice again? Women got the vote now. Maybe you didn't hear about it. So they don't like bachelors. Oh, they don't, huh? Well, if they don't like them, they can lump them. Now, what's the matter with you? Are you nuts? No, I'm just playing hard to get. Now, listen, don't you know... Don't you know what marriage is? Why, it's the most beautiful, uh... You know, the most beautiful setup between two sexes. Don't you know that a wife is like a... Well, uh, like a coat without pants. Like a pig without a poke. Why, marriage is the most, uh... Huh. Then why don't you try it? Because I ain't running for mayor. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, I ain't neither. Poke that in your pig. Good afternoon. Alderman McGinty's office. No, I'm sorry he's out. Yes, Miss Dangerfield, I'll tell him you called. That gold digger, I wish she'd... Oh, hello, Mr. McGinty. I was just... Why, Mr. McGinty, what's the matter? Now he wants me to get married. How do you like that one? Married? What for? Because the women have got the vote, and they don't vote for bachelors. Oh, what are you running for? For mayor. Mayor? Yeah. Reform mayor. Well, that's wonderful, Mr. McGinty. I'm so happy for you. We'll have more fun than a barrel of monkeys. What are you talking about? I told him to go fly a kite. Can you see me telling some rib where I been till two o'clock in the morning? Oh, I don't think it's as bad as all that. Look, I know all about it. My parents was married. <laughs> you catch me walking the floor all night with an armload of little muzzlers yelling in my kisser. Well, uh, you might not have any. What do you mean I mightn't have any? They never had less than eight on either side of my family. Well, I don't want to argue with you, but they really don't yell so much. I mean... Well, of course, it's entirely up to you, but it seems to me an opportunity like this... No, go- thanks. If you think I'm going to get hitched to some Jane I don't even know or give a hoop dee about... Well, how about uh, Miss Lucy Dangerfield? Mm. She just called and wanted you to... In spades. Well, um... Mr. McGinty. Yeah. What about me? Uh-huh. Me. I'd be willing to do it for you. Hey, come again. Well, I don't want to get married either. I feel the same way you do about it. You see, I've already been married, and this way we'd both be protected, and you'd get the women's vote, which is really the important thing, and... Well, what's the matter? Huh? Is anything wrong? The way you look at me, I... Get that phone. Yes, sir. Uh, And if it's Lucy, tell her I won't be over Thank you, Mr. McGinty. It was nice of you to bring me home. Don't mention it. <laughs> nice wedding, wasn't it? Oh, very nice. Uh, Mr. McGinty. Yeah, going to be a swell party, too. The boss sure likes to do things up brown. Yeah, uh, Mr. McGinty, I think I told you I was married before. No fooling. No, it wasn't. Well, uh, there's something I should have told you, I guess. I, uh... Mr. McGinty, we're really married, aren't we? I mean, legally? That's what the guy said. Why? Well, I don't want you to think I've been hiding anything. It was just the excitement and the suddenness and... Mommy! Mommy! Hi, Mommy! (laughs) Children! (laughs) Children, do be quiet. Kids? Uh Uh-huh. Whose? Well, I've been trying to tell you they're mine. So there I was. The wife and family, just like that. But I guess we got along okay, better than lots of families, I bet. You see, they left me entirely alone, and me, I did the same for them. Anyway, until the night I got elected mayor, (laughs) we had a big shindig at the club, and by the time I got home, I was really howling. I was a walking hangover from a barbershop quartet. Oh, fire in the wings of me. There, now, now, just relax, Mr. McGinty. Here, take a sip of this. You'll feel fine in a little while. I feel pretty good right now. 
pretty tough day, though. I could stand some sleep. Well, don't you think you'd better take off your shoes? If I come to bed with my shoes? And your hat. And your suit. Sheesh. Miss Catherine? You in there, Miss Catherine? Yes? Who is it, Bessie? Oh, Mr. George is here. And he tell me to tell you to tell me how long you gonna be. Well, tell him I'll be right out, Bessie. Yes. George, huh? Who's he? Oh, just a friend, that's all. He always wanted to marry me. And since I'm still free, in a way, he just takes me out to dinner. That's all. That's all, huh? Well, ain't that enough? Well, after all. Who does this lug think he is? The proposition and my wife. You mean proposing, Mr. McGinty. And he doesn't anymore. He just takes me to dinner. Well, why can't you eat at home? Is there anything the matter with the grub around here? Well, if there was, Mr. McGinty, you wouldn't know it. Huh? What have I got to do with it? I don't think you have anything to do with it, Mr. McGinty. I'm running your house as best I can. I go to all sorts of clubs and meetings... I'm photographed all the time, just so you might get the woman's vote. If I want to go out quietly with an old friend instead of sitting alone in the evening, I don't really see that it... I... Oh... Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Mr. McGinty. No hard feelings? No, of course not. Shake? Shake. I, uh... I was... thinking... Why don't you, uh... Why don't we go out together sometime? I'd be very glad to, Mr. McGindy. Sometime. Now, if you'll let go of my hand. You know, if you was to tell anybody that we've been living here like this, you at one end of the hall and me at the other, they <laughs> wouldn't believe it. Uh, Mr. McGindy, huh? my hand. Hey, am I still hanging on to your mitt? <laughs> I hope I didn't hurt it any. Not at all. As a matter of fact, it felt... Well, kind of nice. Yeah? Miss Catherine, Mr. George said to make it just as fast as you can. Oh, he does, huh? Well, you can tell him I said he better scram. But, Mr. McGinty... Tell him he's barking up the wrong tree. But, Daniel... Huh? Hey, say that again. Daniel. Gee, <laughs> when you say it soft like that and nice... Holy Toledo, I must have been blind. <laughs> The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. Now, Miss Lorene Tuttle brings you a word from Lady Esther. There are moments in every woman's life when beauty she never dreamed she had flashes suddenly into being. It may be a moment of great joy, a moment of great tenderness. I've often thought, if it were only possible to capture that shining moment, to keep that sudden elusive quality of beauty, then no woman need ever again be plain. In Lady Esther Bridal Pink, I have tried to do just that. I've tried to capture that fleeting look of loveliness in a shade that gives unmistakable radiance to a woman's face. A shade that makes her look happy, vibrant, and alive. Women tell me I have succeeded beyond all expectation. They tell me Bridal Pink instantly lights up their face with new warmth and expression. Gives a glow to their eyes, a lift to their spirits often makes them look as much as ten years younger. It doesn't matter whether your hair is blonde, brunette, auburn, or brown. Lady Esther Bridal Pink is intensely flattering to almost every skin it touches. You see, Lady Esther face powder isn't just mixed in the usual way. It's highly pulverized by the tremendous force of hurricanes. Pulverized so fine it feels light and cool as a summer breeze on your skin. Yet it completely covers tiny lines and blemishes. And it clings four hours and longer. It even makes your features look smaller and daintier. Ask your dealer for Lady Esther Bridal Pink and accept no other shade. Capture that young, joyous look, that radiant look, with Lady Esther Bridal Pink Face Powder. Now, Lady Esther presents the second act of The Great McGinty, starring Akeem Tamirov, Ruth Hussey, and Brian Dunleavy. Well, 
everything's going along pretty smooth now, Catherine and the kids and me. We're mighty happy, and this mayor's job is turning out okay. You see, we're making lots of improvements, and they're paying off big. <laughs> yes, sir, I got that right down to his science. But uh, I don't understand, Mr. Mayor. My company has the bus franchise in this city. We have a contract. Yeah, but there seems to be a flaw in it. A flaw? What kind of a flaw? Well, I wouldn't know. You better see the chairman of the bus committee. Nice fella. If you don't get him mad and treat him nice. Oh, you, uh, you couldn't give me a rough idea of about how nice, could you? I wouldn't know what you're talking about, Mr. Maxwell. Well, glad to see you looking so well. Drop in again and we'll take in a ball game. Do you like baseball? Well, right? I'm not exactly a fan. Well, that's where you fellas make your big mistake. You worry too much about contracts and flaws and things like that. You ought to get out in the open. Fill your lungs with fresh air and forget your troubles. You see, that picture on the wall, Mr. Maxwell, how many people do you think there were at that game? Well, I'm sure I haven't the vaguest idea. I look again. How many people do you think there are in that photograph? Well, I don't know. 10,000? Guess again. 20,000? You're not even warm. Well, frankly, I don't say... Oh. You mean it's more like, uh, 40,000? Well, it's more like it, but that ain't it, Mr. Maxwell. There were 75,000 people at that game. 75,000? 75,000. Wonderful, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> well, goodbye, Mr. Maxwell. I'll send the guy up to see you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Your Honor. Hello, Miss Ryan. Uh, put Maxwell down for 75 grand. That's right. And look, no more appointments this afternoon. <laughs> I gotta get home and read my kids their bedtime story. And just as Peter Rabbit reached the old split rail fence, a shadow fell across his path. And who do you suppose it was? I'll give you three guesses and then three more, but you could try all night without guessing who it really was because it was none other than... Darling. Huh? They're both asleep. Oh, oh, just a minute. None other than our friend Muggle the Wump the Tortoise. <laughs> yeah, that's who I thought it was. You've been wonderful with the children, Dan. They love you so. No kidding. And they're so proud of you. I am too, Dan. I think you're a fine man. Oh, me? Yes, you. You're a tough guy, McGindy, but you're not a wrong guy. If you were on the other side of the fence, you'd play just as hard the other way. Hey, what have you been drinking? Catnip? I suppose I'm being dull. I, I guess I went to many, too uh, many reform lunches this week. I've heard so much about child labor and sweatshops and the fire traps poor people live in. I, well, I just... Oh, that's up to the boss. I couldn't do anything if I wanted to. You mean you would if you could? What? Oh, well, do something about the tenements, maybe. Hmm? Hey, you got some relatives living down there? <laughs> you know I haven't. Dan. All right, all right. Uh, what are you going to do? I ain't exactly sure. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, hello, Mr. Newlywed. You coming over? Now, listen, I got a couple of days... Hey, uh, boss, uh, listen, I happened to come home through the poor district, see, and I was wondering, while we're cleaning up the city, how about a tenement bill? Y you know, make them clean them up, put in some windows and some plumbing and stuff like that. Say, I think that's great. Oh, uh, you do, huh? Sure, I don't know why I didn't think of it. <laughs> this will ring the bell in the house. Now, look, you went to the papers first thing in the morning. Tenements must go. The city without a slum. I'll have a jar with Jarvis send you down the list. What list? The landlords, who they are and what they'll pay to kill the bill. Nice going, boy. Nice going. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah, yeah, good night. What did he say? Like I told you, no soap. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the way I thought it would be. But don't worry, Dan. Maybe you can't do anything now, but someday you will. Someday you'll be strong enough. You wait and see. That's what she kept saying. Someday you'll be strong enough. Of course, I knew she was all wrong about that stuff, but I wanted to make her happy, her and the kids, so... One day I said, I'm strong enough now. That was the day I got elected governor. Yeah. No fooling. They made me governor. Honest Dan McGinty, the people's friend. 
Only the very first day I walk into my office. Morning, Your Excellency. Oh, you here already? Oh, sure. We've got a mighty big job on our hands. Ah, uh, you know, this state needs an awful lot of things. They had honest governors so long, the whole place is in a rack and ruin. Is that so? Sure. Now take the roads, for instance. They're in terrible condition. You know, in case of war, we'd be at the mercy. How would an enemy ever get to here? How would I know? Am I a general? Then, uh, then we'll need uh, new waterworks and state canal and all. Oh, now, you'll kiss me for this one. A new dam. A dam, huh? I see by your expression you don't know what a dam is. A dam is something you put a lot of concrete in. And it doesn't matter how much you put in it. There's always room for a little more. What's the matter with the old dam? Huh? Oh, uh, it's got a crack in it. Oh. Well, can't we just patch up the crack a little? You're kind of dumb this morning, ain't you, Dan? Yeah. Look, you lug. What are you trying to pull? Nothing, nothing. Only there... There ain't going to be no new dams and no roads and nothing that people don't really need. Why, you cheap double-crossing rat. After I spent 400 grand to put you in I'll here... I'll pay you back. Here's the key to my deposit box. I'll pay you the rest out of my salary. And a what salary? You know how long you're going to be here? Yeah, I got an idea. I got an idea where you'll be, too. Listen, sucker. Anything ever happens to me, you'll be in a clink ten minutes later. I can pin so much on you, you look like a... Like a Christmas tree! Ah, you don't scare me none. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to put a child labor bill through, and I'm going to stamp out the sweatshops. Then I'm going to banish the tenements, and then... What do you know about child labor? you never even seen the sweatshop. Who's been talking to you? Who's been telling... Hey, wait a minute. Your wife. Yes, that cheesecake you married. Listen, you make one crack about her. Now look! Don't you know nothing that you know a dame started all the trouble... And you never heard of Samson and Delilah? Or Sodom and Gomorrah? You gonna let her fail like that? I told you not to... Oh, all right. You asked for it. Put down that gun, you brat. I'll right. teach you... Uh... Boy, we had some Brannigans, all right. It ends up with a boss and a clink. Three days later, I'm in there, too, yeah. One of his outfits, the better government league... They start screaming about corruption while I was mayor. They got the dope, too. Why not? He give it to them. So there I was. He and I in the clink together. Me in one cell and him right next door. I hope you like it in here, wise guy. Might as well enjoy it while you can. Ah, who asked you anything? You know how long you're gonna get? Ten to twenty. And not in no country club, either. With that income tax stuff they just dug up, you'll get Leavenworth. Or the beach. Yeah, what are you going to get? A summer vacation? I hope you're satisfied, you rat. The first time I catch you alone, I'll bat your brains all over the ride. Yeah, you and your little brother. I'll smack you so hard you'll meet yourself coming back. If that ain't enough, I'll rip hey, you loose from you. Hey, down, you two. What's the idea? Just having a little conversation. Yeah? Well, any more rumpus, and I'll put you both in solitary. I got the keys right here, and it'll be very simple. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's going to be very simple. Boss. Boss. What's hey. eating you now? Say, did that guard wink at me or am I dreaming? Ain't you getting too old to dream? You mean he's one of the boys? They're springing you? Two o'clock tonight. You better be ready. Me? You mean you're taking me with you? <laughs> Why not? How else am I going to get my mitts on you? Hmm? I know it's late to be calling you, honey, but I got some people waiting and I got to talk fast. But, Dan... Now, listen. I know you'd come along with me, but that ain't right. You got to think about the little guy and the little lady. Dan, where are you phoning from? It doesn't matter now, honey. Look, in the top drawer of my dresser, there's a key. It's got a number in the name of a safe deposit company, and they won't ask you any questions. It's... Well, it's just a little something I held out on you, and it'll keep you going and put the kids through school. <laughs> Without selling magazines. So long, honey. I... I'm sorry it didn't work. Dan... Dan, you can't go away. You can't. I won't let you. Goodbye, honey. Goodbye. Yeah? We come a long way from there. Down here to this jumping-off place where they don't ask you no questions. Ain't so bad, though. 
I don't mind tending bar. I get along. Oh, yeah. Maybe you want to know what came of the boss. Well, you see... Hey, you! I just checked the cash register. What do you mean you just checked the cash register? Do I still have to say everything twice? I just checked the cash register and it's out 12 bucks again. And I'm over. Listen, you fat little four-flesher. Who you call fat? Guess who? Now listen. <laughs> Thank you, Brian Donlevy, Akeem Tamirov, and Ruth Hussey for a delightful half hour. You can count on us, Mr. Bradley. For that matter, you can count on every actor and actress in Hollywood. Because we all know the wonderful work being done by the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And we know that work is largely made possible by this radio program. And now before we tell you about next week's show, Miss Lorene Tuttle brings you a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Hussey. Ladies, how would you like to give your skin a new, lovelier finish? How would you like to say goodbye to those dry, rough little flakes that ruin the effect of your makeup, that make you look older? Here's all you need to do. Just rub Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream into your skin. Rub it well into your skin so it will absorb all those ragged, clinging flakes. Wipe it off, and then feel your face with your fingertips. Feel how the roughness and dryness are gone. Your skin has a new silken finish, a petal-like smoothness, on which powder and makeup look so clear and fresh, so youthful. Lady Esther Face Cream gives your skin a complete beauty treatment every time you use it. First, it thoroughly cleans your skin. Second, it softens your skin, absorbs the dry flakes. Third, it helps nature refine the pores. And fourth, it leaves a smooth, perfect base for powder. If you want to amaze your family and friends by a sudden delightful change in your appearance, try this. First, apply Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. Wipe it off completely. Then apply Lady Esther Bridal Pink, the romantic new powder shade that gives you the radiant, fascinating look of a woman in love. Ask for Lady Esther Face Cream and Lady Esther Bridal Pink Face Powder. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Flesh and Fantasy. It will star Edgar Barrier, Claire Trevor, and John Hodiak. Be sure to listen. Brian Donlevy will soon be seen in the Paramount picture two years before the mast. Akeem Demiroff will soon be seen in the Arnold Pressburger production, Scandal in Paris. The Great McGinty was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, who are now celebrating their third of a century anniversary, and their current release is the Technicolor production, Incendiary Blonde. Music on tonight's program was arranged by Wilbur Hatch and conducted by Lud Gluskin. You save enough on the largest size jar of Lady Esther face cream to buy a box of Lady Esther face powder. So remember, ask for the largest size. This is Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you, and good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you are ever in the San Francisco Bay Area and still love collecting or renting DVDs or VHS tapes, come check out Captain Video and San Mateo at 2837 South El Camino Real. Captain Video is open six days a week and closed on Wednesday, and one of the last traditional video stores still running in the United States. New movies you can rent for $2.99 a day. Old movies you can rent for $2.99 for five days. And if renting isn't your thing, you can also purchase anything you find in the store. Be sure to tell Ira that you heard about Captain Video from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. Happy renting and happy collecting at Captain, Captain Video. Video. Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.